Okay. You all told me you could hear, so. Uh, DJ, where's DJ? I am on the end down here. She's the chief of staff at the Public Protection Cabinet, and we're joined by lots of members of our committee. Um, this is uh, informal, so we want everybody to uh, uh, just relax and take this in, and if you have something to say, we want you to have a chance to, to say it. I'll probably make lots of mistakes, I always do, but I have people who have a lot of experience in correcting my mistakes, so just bear with me if I, if I mess this up. As I think you all know, uh, Governor Bashir formed this task force uh, just a few weeks ago <clears throat> so that we could uh, better develop uh, the understanding of the medical cannabis issue. Uh, this is an issue of considerable currency, not only in Kentucky, but across uh, the nation. Uh, we believe from at least the anecdotal evidence that we've already received that medical cannabis at least holds the promise of alleviating a lot of suffering of a lot of our fellow citizens. But we also know that, that there are people who have a good faith opposition to making this legal. And so this is not a rally for one position or another. This is an effort that Governor Bashir has undertaken to truly hear the voices of Kentuckians in as direct and unfiltered a way as possible. And so in order to, uh, to, to advance that mission, we're holding town halls around the, uh, the Commonwealth this is the second one. There will be two more. And we also have a website where folks can uh, make their comments uh, by email. And in fact, we have, I think, nearly 2,500 email comments so far, and they're still coming in. So there's, there's a lot of interest in this. So before we start, I have just a, a few things to cover. First, I want to uh, give our uh, deepest thanks to Northern Kentucky University for uh, hosting this and making this wonderful facility available to us. Uh, NKU has been a great partner to work with. And I want to thank uh, Alex Kite. Where is Alex? Yes. Um, for working with us to set all this up. And uh, Professor Kite, uh, is the director of the Chase Center on Addiction Law and Policy. And Professor, would you, uh, would you introduce the dean for us? Yes, thanks so much, Secretary Harvey. Thanks uh, to everyone, of course, for coming out. Um, it's really looking forward, I'm sure, as, as everyone on the committee is to hearing what everybody has to say um, here on this topic. Uh, and First, I'm going to introduce uh, Dean uh, Judith Dar, who is the Dean at the Sam and P. Chase College of Law, where I teach and has been uh, helpful in getting this, uh, you know, here at, at, uh, at NKU. Uh, she is specifically the Ambassador Patricia L. Herbold, Dean uh, and a professor here at Sam and P. Chase College of Law. She uh, has a prolific uh, speaker and scholar. Um, in medical and ethical uh, issues, particularly surrounding reproductive medicine. Um, she uh, has, uh, we together have uh, established a Center on Addiction Law and Policy at uh, the law school. And uh, I'm excited to introduce her to, to give a, a welcome to everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I just, I just want to Thank you. 
Thank you, Dean. And again, uh, thanks to you and all the folks at NKU for hosting this event. It's a very important issue that we're discussing and we appreciate your partnership very much. Um, we also have a number of our task force members who have joined us this evening. And I, I would just say that we have 17 Kentuckians that have volunteered their time to advance uh, the understanding of this issue. These are people from uh, all across Kentucky, from a lot of different disciplines who really bring uh, a great deal of experience and expertise concerning uh, this and, and related issues. And the, the governor I know is very anxious to uh, take advantage of their expertise. I'm just gonna read the names of all of our task force members and if you happen to hear your name and you're, you're here, please raise your hand, make yourself known. And I really appreciate the fact that so many of them uh, have been able to join us for this event this evening. And I know that we have many others who are, who are watching this by Zoom. Uh, Dr. Amber Can of LaGrange, a pharmacist and business owner. Uh, Julie Cantwell of Rineville, an advocate with Kentuckians for medical marijuana. <laughs> Jennifer Cave of Louisville, a uh, member of the law firm of Stites and Harbison. Uh, Eric Crawford of Maysville, an advocate uh, concerning this issue. Uh, Cookie Cruz of uh, Frankfurt, who serves as the uh, commissioner of the Department of Corrections for the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Uh, Dr. John Farmer of Louisville, the uh, medical director of Solid Ground Counseling and Recovery, an addiction treatment provider in Louisville, Moorhead, and Hazard. Uh, Dr. Jonathan Hatton of Whitesburg, family medicine practitioner, Mountain Comprehensive Health. Brian Jointer of Jeffersonville, Indiana, a certified public health worker in Louisville. Dr. Nick Coons, a uh, palliative care physician, Clark Regional Medical Center. Uh, Alex Kite of Cincinnati, who you've already met, who's the director of the Chase Center on Addiction Law and Policy here at NKU, and certainly uh, brings a great deal of expertise uh, concerning a lot of issues related to the one that we're talking about tonight. Dr. Linda McLean of Louisville, Commonwealth Counseling Center. Uh, Andrew Sparks of Lexington. Andrew was a, uh, an assistant U.S. attorney for 15 years, uh, meaning that uh, he sent a lot of people to jail. Uh, he's, and I will say that I had the honor of working with Andrew in the Justice Department. We were in the Justice Department together for seven years. Uh, Andrew is now a partner at the law firm of Dickinson Wright in uh, Lexington. And Andrew brings a uh, very deep background in understanding law enforcement issues and the criminal justice system at the federal level. 
D.D. Uh, D. Taylor of Louisville, the Chief Executive Officer of 502 Hemp Wellness Center. Uh, Julie Wallace of Morganfield. Julie is the County Attorney in Union County, and she brings a great deal of expertise concerning uh, criminal justice issues and law enforcement issues at, at the state level. And Kristen Wilcox of Beaver Dam, the co-founder of Kentucky Moms for Medical Cannabis. So does that cover it? I think, I hope we got everybody. Um, so I'll be finished at, uh, very shortly and turn the floor over to you all, but I do want to make just a few statements about uh, the general ground rules. Uh, in a few minutes, we will uh, open up the floor for discussion. And there's a couple of things that this discussion is not about, and I want us to keep that in mind. First, it is not about the merits or demerits of recreational marijuana or the legalization of recreational marijuana. Sometimes these issues get conflated, I think, and that's unfortunate because they're, they're, they are separate issues and I think there are separate considerations for both. So this is not about recreational marijuana use or the legalization of recreational marijuana. Uh, this is also not a partisan political um, issue and I'm glad of that and I hope that that we can avoid uh, partisan discussions or political discussions because there's really uh, concerning this issue no no reason for that the public polling indicates that there's widespread support among Republicans Democrats and independents for uh, legalized medical cannabis but as I said earlier there are also important voices who are opposed to medical cannabis, and those voices need to be heard and considered and respected as well. Um, as we indicated, there are 38 states and I think four territories that have made medical cannabis available to their citizens, and we want to explore uh, what should be done in Kentucky and more specifically what the governor might do to advance this issue uh, in the Commonwealth. So as we get into the speaking, each speaker will have uh, five minutes. We will monitor the time. I think we have a, a good number of folks who have signed up to speak tonight. So we may be uh, a, a little bit strict on enforcing the time limit. We're committed to uh, sending everybody home by, by seven or, or at least a few minutes after. Um, so please be respectful and honor the time limit. I do want you to know that this meeting is being recorded and will be posting at, posted at medicalcannabis.ky.gov. So if you make your remarks here tonight, a lot of people will end up uh, hearing what you have to say, and that might make you happy or it might not, but, uh, but you should be aware of that. And that's also the same uh, site, by the way, where uh, if you choose not to speak tonight, or if you don't say have time to say everything that you would want the governor to hear, uh, you, can, you can submit email comments, uh, and there is no limit on, uh, on the email comments. And as I indicated earlier, already 2,500 of your fellow citizens have, have made their voice heard on this issue by email. Um, we'll also be taking good notes and, and uh, I can promise you that we will uh, assimilate all that we hear in this and all the other town halls and we will make sure that Governor Bashir has the benefit of your opinion and your wisdom concerning this issue as he uh, searches for a way forward. Um, we will first call up our speakers who have, uh, who have registered uh, to speak tonight. And then if we have additional time, we'll open it up to others. But before we do that, I want to uh, introduce uh, State Representative Buddy Wheatley. Uh, Representative, where, where are you? And uh, the, uh, okay. Representative Wheatley represents District 
65 Kenton, Kenton County. And uh, we'll ask you for your remarks, Representative, and we're, we're very appreciative that you're here tonight. Thank you, thank you, Secretary Kerry, and I'll, I'll be brief. I actually have two sets of remarks, I'll be quick. Uh, we, I'd like to welcome everybody to Northern Kentucky. We are honored to have you here. We're honored to have this, this discussion. It's very important to us legislators to understand the issue and to have a full vetting of it. So we're appreciative of the governor and this committee. I'm first gonna read a statement from Secretary, I'm sorry, from uh, State Representative Rachel Roberts. She's not a secretary. You demoted yet. her a good <laughs> deal there. She won't appreciate that. And uh, quite simply, it says, I'm so sorry I cannot be there in person today. I'm attending a conference on insurance oversight and policy, which one day will hopefully intersect with prescription coverage for medical marijuana. I am grateful to, the, to Governor Bashir for installing this committee and especially locally grateful for Chase Law Professor Alex Kreitz's involvement. I believe the conversation is long overdue. Kentucky has become an outlier as 38 states and many of them, our neighboring states, have legalized some form, form of cannabis. In the amendment I filed with the House that the House passed earlier this year, I would urge the group to ensure that coverage of mental health issues, specifically PTSD treatment, be included in any list of permissible, permissible diagnosis. I look forward to the comments and recommendations that come from today and from the town halls around the state. The end of her statement. And myself, I was a little bit slower coming to this issue as far as a supporter, but I do support medical marijuana, mar medical cannabis, uh, great advocates in Frankfurt have uh, helped to convince me, but also a lot of evidence and some evidence I was gonna get into, but I'll be brief tonight to say I am on the side of this support, but I do look forward to hearing from the rest of the uh, people who are speaking tonight. Uh, I do have an open mind on this issue. I have surveyed it for my district, which it surveys just as high as some of the numbers you had mentioned, Mr. Uh, Secretary. And uh, I will, uh, of course, be listening uh, throughout the rest of the town halls too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate you being here, Representative. Um, I think we're, we're ready to get to it now. And what I'm gonna do is I've got a list of people that signed up uh, to speak, and I'm just going to call your names one at a time. Come to the microphone. You'll have five minutes. Uh, as I indicate, you know, it's possible that there there might be some uh, interaction or there might be some questions, but we do have a number of people that have signed up to speak tonight. So we want to make sure that we uh, that we get through everyone that is signed up, and then if we have additional time. You know, again, recognizing that somewhere around seven o'clock, it'll be it'll be time to go home. Uh, we'll open it up for others or, or have a little more uh, interactive discussion. So we will start uh, with Mr. Jason Merrick. It's Jason Merrick here. Okay, Miss Erin Conley. Okay. <laughs> um, first of all, I want to thank you for this opportunity to be able to speak to you. Uh, my name is Erin Conley. I'm a lifelong resident of Bracken County, Kentucky. I've been a public school teacher for 20 years, all in the state of Kentucky. I have three children, Emma, Allie, and Bryn. Two of my three children have epilepsy. My oldest daughter, Emma, who is also a Kentucky teacher, and our baby, 14-year-old Brennan, who's sitting back there and probably thoroughly embarrassed that I just pointed him out. Well, um, he needs to stand up so we can all see him. Let's, there he is. Yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> he has what um, is referred to as intractable epilepsy, meaning that he has seizures that are uncontrollable at times, resistant to the use of anti-epileptic drugs. He's been on seizure med, seizure med since he was two years old. Um, he had his first intractable seizure at the age of eight months old. In fourth grade, however, his seizures became so uncontrollable that he was having anywhere from 75 to 100 seizures a day. Um, and that's not in a week, that's not in a month, that's every single day. And we're scrambling to try to find a medication that would work for him. 
In a year's time, we went through five medication changes until we found Depakote and it did stop his seizures. Depakote was known as a last resort drug because of the side effects, but Brennan was seizure free for about three years. However, during that time, he gained 75 pounds. He developed tremors, migraines, and developed a very unhealthy, unhealthy and insatiable appetite for food, any food. After three years of being seizure free, the neurologist wanted to try to wean him off his meds, thinking it was possible that he'd outgrown them. Um, it took three months to wean him off from the Depakote, and he spent another three months with no seizures and no meds. But then um, on New Year's Eve 2021, 20, he had a grand mal seizure on the family farm, and we started this battle all over again. His biggest fear came true when he had a seizure at school in front of the entire eighth grade class at recess at the indoor state track meet in Louisville in front of the entire audience, and then more than one time at church youth, church youth events. Kids the same age as my son are playing travel baseball, hanging out at friends' houses, being invited to pool parties, movies with a group of peers, playing video games until the wee hours of the morning. My son worries about his medication, getting too hot, setting timers to avoid triggers like too much screen time, never having alone time because he can't have a seizure and be all by himself. Imagine being a teenage boy and never having any privacy. Put yourself in my son's place and you would find that it's a pretty isolated place to be. Because of the stress brought on by his recent seizures, he has also been diagnosed with adjustment disorder accompanied with panic disorder. He loves his track team, but he struggles to compete because of his anxiety. He loves a band, but he constantly worries about getting too hot in a crowded gym and having a seizure at a ball game. No child should carry these burdens around with them on a daily basis. I have a list of some things that I would like to share with you. Cramps, drowsiness, increased hair growth, nausea, vomiting, nearsightedness, chest pains, lethargy, aggressive behavior, anger, rage, anxiety, chills, cough, burning, crawling skin, prickling skin, numbness of the limbs, abnormal or nightmarish dreams, headaches, migraines, life-threatening rash, suicidal thoughts, depression, dizziness, insomnia, loss of coordination, loss of appetite and weight loss, increase of appetite and weight gain, bladder pain, liver toxicity, mental changes, double vision, tremors, low platelet count, hair loss, mania, Diarrhea, panic attacks, constipation, increase or changes in seizure activity, bloody or cloudy urine. What I have listed and shared with you are the side effects of anti-epileptic drugs, specifically the ones that Bryn has taken for seizures in his lifetime, all of which are legal in our state. How many of you would choose those kinds of drugs for your children if those drugs could commonly cause only a few of what I've listed above. This is the only choice we have. The natural choice, one that can not only take away the seizures, but take away these terrible side effects is a choice not afforded to us. It's an opportunity that my child is being denied. But here's one thing that I can promise you, cannabis doesn't come with a ginormous list of side effects like the ones I just listed. What it does come with is an opportunity for my son and for other children like him. Children who suffer at the hands of those who refuse to see the healing qualities of a plant created by a God that I worship every single day of my life. It comes with hope for a future without seizures. It comes with a promise that people like my son can one day live a normal seizure-free life, a life filled with the normal stuff, a driver's license, the movies, video games, hanging out with friends, alone time when you need it, and a chance to stop the worry, to stop the panic, and enjoy the beauty that this life has to offer. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am, for that compelling statement. It takes a lot of courage to talk about things that are so personal and uh, your, your children are lucky that they have a mama that's willing to do that. Okay, next, um, Mr. Ben Harris. Okay, 
uh, Lee Melton. Hi. Um, so I've been an advocate for medical cannabis for a really long time now. Uh, sorry, that story was just breathtaking breathtaking, honestly, because I couldn't imagine the pain that she has to go through every day for her child or all of her children. Could, could um, you maybe step up a little closer to the yes. mic, a little trouble Hi, here? Yes. Thank you. I have a spinal condition that I deal with on a regular basis um, that causes me a lot of pain, and um, I don't have access to medical cannabis. Um, with that, it's, it's scoliosis, and um, I go through regular chiropractic adjustments on a, on a weekly basis to adjust it and um, bring me back to alignment. Um, with this condition, it causes anxiety, depression, um, lack of sleep, insomnia, um, nervousness. Um, sometimes um, it can just affect my overall well being and I can't function. Um, so I been advocating for medical cannabis because I think that it's needed in Kentucky. I think that the natural option is a lot safer than prescription pills and narcotics that may get me addicted. Um, and so I also am in support for medical cannabis for the natural side of it. Um, if it comes from a facility, then there's um, less worry about, you know, glyphosate or Roundup being in it um, or chemicals um, from the soil. So that's very important to me um, because a lot of times um, if, you know, it's not monitored, those things are in there and it can also cause more detrimental, um, um, it could cause more harm than good um, in that state. So, um, I'm completely for medical cannabis in that sense because it needs to be regulated and it needs to, you know, be accessible in that in that state of um, just being a facility and having um, the right people handle it. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Probably get the the name wrong, but uh, Lige Sizemore. Never know if that was wrong or not. Uh, Benjamin T. D. Pugh. Jessica Sipe. Kristen Ritchie. Hello. Uh, thank you all uh, for having this panel so you can hear our stories. I was born in Kentucky, I was born in Kenton County, grew up in Boone County, live in Campbell County, married a Kenton County boy. <laughs> um, my 250 cousins, aunts, uncles, second cousins all live in Northern Kentucky. Um, and my husband is in pain every single day. <laughs> Sorry, she made me cry. <laughs> no, he was diagnosed with MS in 2012. And for those of you who may not know, his immune system chomps away at his nerve endings, to put it nicely. <laughs> and it causes them to send thousands of singles, signals to his muscles over and over and over and over again. He takes 3,600 milligrams of one is that one, gabapentin, 300 milligrams of tramadol, and he has an infusion once a month of Depakon, and he's still in pain every day. Marijuana has been proven to slow the signals of his damaged nerves, give him the possibility of feeling normal and out of pain. And I just want him to have that chance where I live, I can look out my street, I can look out my window and I can see Ohio and I can sell my house. I can move over there. We could get in that medicine, but I love this state. I want this state to take care of me the way, and I, I wanna be with my family. I still wanna be a Kentuckian. 
So please, please, please let people have access to what works. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Patricia Townsend. Kara McNeil. Hi, my name is Kara McNeil. Um, I'm a licensed massage therapist in the state of Ohio and Kentucky, and I'm a certified caregiver through the VA of downtown Cincinnati. And, and could, I'm sorry, but could you speak up a little bit? I'm sorry, I'm very quiet. Um, licensed massage therapist in Kentucky and Ohio. Um, and I'm also a certified caregiver through the VA um, in downtown Cincinnati for my husband. Um, I work on clients as a massage therapist, age ranging from 20s to 70s. Um, and already in the state of Ohio, I have noticed a huge difference with a lot of my clients who are not in as much pain, who have a different sense of well being and control over how they feel. Um, as my husband's caregiver, please excuse me, this is challenging. Um, he takes four pills in the morning and nine at night. And he's in pain a lot. He does, he has a lot of anxiety, PTSD. Um, he takes pills to counteract the pills and the side effects that he takes. Um, there's a, and that's not including things that if he has a moment of high anxiety or severe pain, um, the VA and other doctors have prescribed narcotics that are highly addictive, and that's dangerous for a lot of our veterans who do not have the access and help that they need. Um, medical marijuana would limit the amount of pharmaceuticals he's taking and allow him a safer way so that his body wasn't processing all of that. Um, with him having a heart condition, there's a lot of medications that he has to take. And with the PTSD and high anxiety, there's a lot of things that counteract that. And he needs to take the heart pills because they keep his heart beating. But then he lives in chronic pain. Then he can't sleep at night. Then he's afraid to go out in public. Otherwise, he'd be here today. This is so important. This is so important to take care of the people that we love, to see them not in pain. And I really hope that this makes a difference and that this makes some changes because there's so many people that truly need a more natural way to not hurt themselves anymore and to be in less pain. So thank you. Thank you. Norman Burton. Trey LaRosa. Well, I think that is the list of those who, yes. Right, so we're, how many here would like to speak? Okay, we wanna accommodate as many as we can. So what I would ask you all to do is if you would just please honor the time limit. So hopefully we can, we can hear from everybody. And so if we, I know sometimes when you're passionate you know, it's easy to kind of get going. So don't be offended if somebody cuts you off. My staff cuts me off all the time, uh, usually before five minutes. So don't be offended if that happens. Ma'am, we'll start with you. Uh, so my name is Osha. I grew up in Mount Sterling, been gone 40 years, was on the West Coast where um, marijuana from Washington to Oregon to California happened. Um, I'm all about compliancy. I've been a formulator in the nutraceutical industry for over 20 years. Um, when I got to Kentucky, I was kind of tried to talk to people about the hemp situation, which I was really concerned about. And growing is really important, but CGMP manufacturing is just as important. Uh, it's important to serve the communities of Kentucky, and it's also important to do it in a way that where there's compliancy and 
testing, because in nutraceuticals, we have to do that every day. Um, I've been formulating with cannabinoids and herbal products as a combination for six years and consulting in the hemp and uh, THC world. So um, like if you grow hemp or marijuana in tobacco fields and it's sucking up all the poisons from the tobacco, which it's a highly, it's a plant that absorbs and you don't test that plant for the pesticides and herbicides in the tobacco fields, it ends up in the end product. And a lot of the people in Kentucky who are making CBD products, that is one of the problems that I have with that because the state doesn't require that they test for the poisons from the fields to the full extent, full panel that they could. So it's really important when you're getting medicine from anybody to make sure that they know the source. And um, I hope it passes in Kentucky. I came back to bring my wisdom and knowledge. Um, I wish I was on the panel because I know so much about this industry from top to bottom, from seed to shelf. And uh, um, I hope my friend speaks. She is a mama doc and she's also from areas in the country where marijuana is legal and she's been making medicine and taking care of end of life people. And you can't just make a gummy and put THC in it or a cookie because you don't know where it's gonna end up in the cookie. And just because it says a 50 milligram, well, you know, of whatever, THC, DA, CBD, whatever, people take four or five. So they can't do that in package. You know, there's a woman who got $20 million in the UK to do studies on marijuana. I called her. I'm like, I've got a friend who owns a biotech company. He studied marijuana and bred it for over 20 years. And there's specific strains for specific illnesses in the body. And if you wanna be 20 years ahead from where you are right now, or you wanna spend the 20 million and be still 15 years behind, that's your choice. But I'm hoping that Kentucky gets on board that you guys look at all the things that have worked in the country and the things that haven't worked in the country and compliancy and providing safe medicine to people for me is the number one thing that I care about. Thank you. Thank you. And again, just another reminder, medicalcannabis.ky.gov is the website. And for those who, uh, if, if somebody doesn't get to speak, all those emails will be read and considered. Is there anyone else from this section over here that wants to speak? Again, I don't, I don't want to uh, harp on this too much, but let's try to try to keep it concise so that we can get to as many folks as we can. Hi. Thank you, ma'am. I'm Jessica, and um, at, at the request of my friend, I came down to join her because she came back to her home state to heal a family. There's a lot of people that need the healing right now. Uh, hemp and cannabis is not just something that we could survive with, but it's the only plant that we actually need to thrive. We have a natural and the cannabinoid system. It was created for us. This medicine, whether, whether you break it apart, but full spectrum, whole plants are best. We can heal our soils. We talk about glyphosate or other chemicals in the, in the ground. I do believe within three years, you run two crops of hemp onto your soil, you can get certified organic. Those fibers that we could bring up can create uh, fibers and uh, can of cretes, hemp cretes, so no part goes wasted. When you talk about cures and healing, we talk about how we heal each other. And, we, and we, we need each other to reach out to restore these healthy endocannabinoid systems. You'll find that instances of mental illness, mental health issues, wellness will drop significantly. How can we think in love if we cannot think it to process because we don't have proper nutrition because we're, we're unwell? In instances of, of uh, multiple sclerosis, this allows the brain to, uh, with the lesions, to help to form synopsis. 
to shut down the neuropathy. Your body has over 140 receptors in the brain. And that's just in brain. It's in your bones, it's in your organs, it's in your marrow, it's in your skin. Every man, woman, and child in America can be healed. And we just have to reach out to each other and understand this is a plan. And to heal each other. So through fibers, food, medicine, it can feed us, clothe us, shelter us. All we need is each other. And I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak. It. And uh, we're, we're available. I would love to speak with you. I, I work with soil amendments, growing indoors, um, formulating products. But what brought me in was uh, the cancer. I, I worked in uh, ran it, running a therapeutic horseback riding program. Uh, I worked with a wide variety of individuals, adults to children, uh, several palsy, uh, a lot of autisms. Autism really keeps coming forth. It was something that I could do it when people would say how hopeless they felt. And people would come to me knowing that I would help them with this, no matter what. Where I used to be the last hope, I became the, last, the first line of defense. And I look to everyone here to take up that arm. Make no mistake, we're coming out of a war and a war on us. Our wellness, our families, our communities, our earth, our sky, our air. Just a little plant, a little seed, we could take it back. And hit this to say that I love you. I love you. Thank you. Anyone else from this section? Ma'am? My name is Michelle Hughes. This is my daughter, Gabrielle. You need to speak up. Okay. <laughs> um, obviously, this is emotional. My daughter was diagnosed with duplication 15Q. She was the first child in Cincinnati Children's Hospital to be diagnosed with this. It was in 2004. Epilepsy, autism, mental retardation, there's a whole list. Eight major disabilities come with it, and Tourette's is also one of them. She's um, been seizure-free 13 years and has started having seizures again. Children with this disability, when that happens, it's much like cancer, breast cancer. Treatment doesn't work anymore and they die from their seizures. Kids who don't even have this severity of seizures um, are passing away in their sleep at night with this disability. Gabrielle was a very physically fit kid. She still is. She's in a wheelchair so that if she has a seizure, she doesn't get hurt. We had to move back to Kentucky where I was raised and born um, so I could be near family. We were in Idaho for five years and she hiked 174 miles in the mountains there with her teacher while I worked. Sorry. CBD oil and medical marijuana can cause seizure medication to become toxic. And I don't know how many people fairly, fully appreciate that. Or completely not beneficial in the body at all if you take it at the same time as pharmaceuticals. Because of that, I cannot use CBD oil or marijuana on my daughter because she has been seizure free for 13 years and I didn't wanna mess with that. But now she's not seizure free. The problem is it messes with the cytochrome P450. So you can Google that and it would explain. People who sell CBD oil don't necessarily know that. And so they could cause my daughter to die by giving her CBD oil without instruction. But the beautiful thing is if the doctors could give it to her, not just CBD oil, but also possibly medical marijuana, they could regulate, they could instruct, they could help us know so we could do it the right way. Medical marijuana could be the first course of action instead of having to go through five or six multiple different trials of medication that won't necessarily help her 
that may teach her brain how to continue having seizures, even though it would have been at a therapeutic rate. Gabrielle is wearing clothes that were sent to her from another girl in our disability group her age who passed away two years ago, excuse me, two months ago. Her name was Kelly Allman. She was very physically fit. When her pharmaceutical medicine stopped working, the doctors tried other things and she died. Her family now sends clothes and support in hope that I will stand up and remember her while I also fight for my own daughter. SUDEP is a very real thing, sudden unexplained death and epilepsy. According to the CDC, 1.16 of every 1,000 children die of this. This is only children. My daughter is 21. So the children her age, four that I know of this year, who have passed away, they don't get in that count. So it's grossly underestimated. In 1999, an application was filed by the US Department of Health and Human Services for a patent for cannabinoids as antioxidants and neuroprotectants. It was granted patent number US 6630507B1 in 2003. Now I understand the good that can come from the government securing a patent. I, I can see that logically because it would help the people that they would regulate kind of what I'm asking to have done. So I completely understand that. I also know that that patent didn't necessarily involve the THC aspect of it. Let me also mention that we also know that COVID did not go through decades of research and yet it was found medically safe and effective. Cannabinoid, THC, the whole bit has had decades of research and we have had millions of people who have tried it and not died of liver failure like they do on the medicine she's on if they don't die from the seizures. So what I believe we should be doing is, first of all, appreciating Governor Bershear for doing this. I mean, I applaud you. This is huge and it's given us a voice and we need that voice. We know the Kentuckians will give the shirt off their back to help anyone. All you had to do is see the Kentucky, Western Kentucky tornado to know and even what Governor Bashir saw and said. We're better than this, Kentucky, and we can save our children before it's too late. So she's done, so I'm done. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I think next we'll go to the center section here, people that want to speak and yes, sir. My name is Jared Bonville. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. This is a tough story to tell because I went to Iraq in 2007. When I came back, it wasn't quite right. Got on a lot of medication and started going through therapy. And then I got to go to Afghanistan. Lived on the side of a mountain for a year and I lost a lot of good people. When I came back, I was put in charge of the state of Montana and Alberta, Canada for all felony level criminal investigations and counterintelligence for the United States Air Force and Department of Defense. I ran some of the largest criminal and counterintelligence investigations for the Department of Defense. I understand the law enforcement implications of what you're trying to do. And I ask you to pay attention to a few things. The Declaration of Independence life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. After Afghanistan, I was on 13 medications and I wanted to eat a bullet every single day. My daughter didn't see her daddy anymore. Some old hippie pulled me aside one day and he said, you need to make a change. I said, I don't know what change I need to make because all the doctors are telling me I got to do this, 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 and this. But while I was on the side of that mountain in Afghanistan, I was taking Soma, Mephextra XR, Clonazepam, and Ambien. And still getting attacked, still running out to the fight, still coming back. Didn't want to live anymore. 
this old hippie says, man, don't trust the doctors. I was like, what are you talking about? I've been a cop my life. I, I'm not going to go out and start using weed. He said, just trust me. Just one time, please, because he cared about me. I took a puff, and I sat down on the couch and sat there and talked to him. And within about 30 minutes, I started feeling better. I didn't want to commit suicide. In my job, I investigated all those suicides. The only reason I didn't do it is because I didn't want to leave that to my family. I saw what the families go through to this. They put me on one medication one time, Lyrica. I woke up and I saw demons coming out of the walls. You know what the doctor told me? Well, that's okay. How about just cut the dose in half? <laughs> really? You want me to see demons every night? That was their expectation. And I had always gone along with the right thing. If a doctor tells me to do something, I'm going to do it. That one puff, drop the medication. Second puff, drop another medication. Within a year, I didn't drink, and I was off of 12 of those 13 medications. Now, I still have all those injuries and disabilities, but I can function. When I was retired, I was 250 pounds on a cane. I can function. I can live. I can have friendships. I can have conversations. I haven't publicly spoken five years, and now I can be up here doing this. I've been involved in three different states medical programs and they have all disappointed me because if you go to, let's just use Ohio, for example, top shelf cannabis is $500 an ounce. A medical patient is going to use a minimum of one ounce a week, possibly two. How many of you on this board can afford two to $4,000 a month? <laughs> Not a single one of us. I guarantee you the governor, he couldn't. So I ask that if it's going to be, a medical program, you think of the patient. Think of all these people in here that 10 people in a room with the FDA will approve God knows what that we can go to the store buy and put in our body that may cause all these problems. But a plant that's been here for thousands of years that our government has controlled, we need to get away from that. Come back to personal responsibility. Don't make the laws too difficult so that law enforcement can't do their job you know put it on the person if a person wants to save their life save their family if they want to grow a little bit that's fine i really don't care about the big business of it i want people to be able to survive and i don't want them to want to eat a bullet every day thank you yeah. yes sir and if you would, uh, when you introduce yourself, please uh, state your name and the county where you're from. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Jay Armstrong. I'm from Kenton County. And I had intended on just asking a question, uh, but listening to everybody, I'm share a little bit of my experience. Uh, I am a drug addict in recovery. Uh, I've been sober since November 8th of 2005. Uh, throughout my life, I've suffered from PTSD, uh, major depressive disorder with suicidal ideation, uh, today I'm okay and I don't take any meds and I don't consume cannabis products either, but it took almost 20 years of therapy and all the different meds that I tried, everything from Prozac to Clonopin to Librium to Zyprexa to Seroquel, uh, everything, you know, and, uh, I'm at a point now in my life where I'm, where I'm fine. But as I've read all these different success stories from people with the same mental illnesses that I've suffered from my whole life, they get almost instant relief using medical cannabis. Not a single med a doctor has ever prescribed me has been something that I know right away whether or not it's going to work. And it's always kind of felt like a scam. You know, well, the Prozac's not working, doc. Well, you've only taken it for six weeks. You got to take it for at least six months. I don't, I, I don't get that. I could have tried cannabis right in the beginning and skipped all those nights that I'm punching concrete floors so that I don't take my own life. You know, uh, I told myself I wasn't going to get emotional like everybody else did, but, uh, and I also have a child with an autoimmune disorder. Uh, she has Crohn's, you know, and uh, we, we live in Kentucky and we're not, we're not going to try that route, you know, at this point, because at this point I, I wouldn't have a doctor, you know, telling me, this is when, this is how, this is, you know, why. And, you know, the, 
I could have so many so thousands of nights for my family could have not been in terror wondering whether or not I'm going to come home or whether or not I'm going to kill myself. You know what I mean? Like, it's not just like with mental illness, it doesn't just affect one person. It affects every single person that they're around and every single person they love. And the level of harm that my mental illness has created could have been shrunk significantly had there been a doctor to, to be able to walk me through that process. Now, as a teenager, I smoked lots of weed, but there was no therapeutic value to that. You know what I mean? It was just me and, and, and the other potheads getting stoned. And then we moved on to heroin and uh, most of us are dead you know, or in prison. So the, the question that I was going to ask, because it is important to me and the people around me and my community, every single person I've talked to about medical cannabis, the first thing they, they tell me is, you know, well, you just want it so that you want it legalized so that, you know, you can get high again. And it's like, well, if you look at my criminal record, legality has never been a consideration for any decision that I've ever made. Uh, but the level of harm that we're causing each other is just crazy and it could be it could be helped or at least that harm could be reduced if not cured completely but the question that I have is how do you deal with these people who are against us that there's no rationale there's no logic to it it's purely being emotionally attached to an idea that cannabis is bad and that cannabis is a gateway drug for me cannabis was a gateway drug because the dare officer I'm not, I'm not talking about all cops but uh a D.A.R.E. officer showed up at my school in fifth grade and told me that cannabis is just as evil as crack cocaine, right? So when I found out that one of my uncles consumed cannabis, probably smoked weed well, at the time, I'm trying to sound professional, but back then we weren't. Uh, he's not a bad guy, right? So I'm going to try, I'm going to try weed. So I tried weed and I didn't rob a liquor store or do anything crazy. Well, so now they're just lying to me about everything. You know what I mean? That's why cannabis can become a gateway drug because of the way we inform children that cannabis is just as evil as heroin and crack cocaine. And we know that it's not, you know, as a grown up, you find, well, yeah, obviously there should have been some nuance there, but as a kid, you don't know that you just know that they're lying to me about everything. So how do you deal with people that are emotionally attached to these ideas that cannabis is this evil thing that robs parents, of the, you know, the, reefer madness nonsense at a, at a 40s 50s and 60s you know but so I, I don't know how to do that so I assumed that the panel was here to answer questions so if you could answer that for me at some time through the night I would appreciate it thank you I, I have a I have a question for you sir could I, could I ask you a question you if I understood you correctly you indicated that you have a child that that has a health care condition that you think might benefit from cannabis from what but, we've read yes but you and I under I think you're being very responsible you you know you don't want to access this without proper medical advice correct if you were able to to leave Kentucky to go across the river and see a physician and get that kind of medical advice and then do what you needed to do in Kentucky was is that something you would do yeah I would much rather just stay in Kentucky well so <laughs> That's kind of a weird question because in Northern Kentucky, we have, there's a pretty much monopoly on healthcare. Yeah. So we go to Cincinnati for her healthcare as it is. Uh, we go to Cincinnati Children's. But if there was a doctor there or a doctor here, I don't yeah. care. If I had to drive six hours to get to a doctor, as the way it is now, if you're a Kentucky resident, you can't get a card in Ohio unless you forge, you know, commit fraud and say that you have an address over right. there. But yeah, we would at least be willing to look at it. We read all these things. The medication she takes now has had us terrified throughout COVID because its whole point is to suppress her immune system. Right. So if we could have something that didn't do that, man, you should have seen me. I was one of those COVID crazies. Like I would come out of Costco, I would go into Costco with Lysol, spray everything before I put it in my cart and then spray it again before I put it in my cart because I was terrified for my kids, sure. you know? So yeah, if there was something that we could have had then, we definitely would have entertained it. Okay, thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Anyone else in the center section? Yes, ma'am. Good evening. Um, my name is Rose. I live in Kenton County, and I appreciate you all coming to Northern Kentucky. Um, in full transparency, I am a nurse practitioner, and one of my questions is there are almost or over 10,000 licensed nurse practitioners or advanced practice nurses in Kentucky. And I don't see, or I didn't hear any represented on the board or on this commission. So, you know, if you take 10,000 and how many patients, those nurse practitioners probably care for 10, tens to hundreds of thousands of patients. So I would, 
encourage you to have an advanced practice nurse practitioner as a representative on this commission. And let me just say, ma'am, I appreciate that. I think we, we all do. And, and we know that that is a very important voice to hear and we want to hear that voice. At, at some point, I think when, when you're putting together a group like this, you just, you run into the practicalities because it, it's, if you include uh, every important group like that, unfortunately, you end up with a group that just becomes so unwieldy that, that it's, it's hard to make it function. But uh, we certainly want to hear the, the voice of the folks that you represent. And I can, I can appreciate that. I thought that was not the answer I thought you were gonna give me. <laughs> and I thought the answer was gonna be, well, it's a controlled substance. And that's why we don't want nurse practitioners on the board. No. Because my concern, and I'm for medical marijuana, I will put that out there, especially for conditions like MS, epilepsy, PTSD, Crohn's, all those conditions that people have talked about. I am for that. My concern is, belonging to organizations for my profession, listening to blogs and podcasts, things like that, it's become a money maker. Mm -hmm. It is all about money. Like the one gentleman said, it's outpriced. These, it's an easy job for a doctor. And I, I know that's gonna probably get mm -hmm. criticism, but in some states, it just becomes a rubber stamp. Everybody that goes into the clinic gets approval, gets their car card and then they can go get their medical marijuana and yes some of those people need it probably some of them don't or not medically needed okay um so i would hope that this commission would put into place some type of oversight of the clinics or the dispensaries um, so that it doesn't just become a rubber stamp <laughs> You know, even in Ohio, every couple months, they petition to add a new condition. And, you know, pretty much you're opening the door for everything everyone says, I need this for, they need it. And maybe they do. I'm not against that. But like I said, I think it needs to be, have good oversight and not the good old boys club, like, oh, we're making money from this and just keep rubber stamping it. The state's making money. The doctors are making money. And, in, and it's just like the big pharma that produced the opioids. They made money. And look who suffered. It's the people that suffer. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate your, your remarks. And those are uh, in, important points that have to be considered. I do want to take just a second to, to just remind the group again, I, I want our expectations to be set appropriately of, of what, uh, what this group can do. Um, I think what we are doing is we're providing a conduit from you to the governor to hear your point of view and to hear your stories so that Governor Bashir, who has heard a lot of these stories already, can uh, appropriately consider what action he might take to advance this issue. But I have to say, and I'm sure if he was here, he would say that, you know, executive action in this area is not non-existent, but it is limited ultimately to set up a, a full-blown regime of uh, legalized medical cannabis regulated by the Commonwealth of Kentucky, you have to have legislative action. And this issue remains a live one in the legislature. In the last session of the General Assembly, uh, it passed the House of Representatives uh, on a bipartisan basis, I think with the majority of Democrats and a majority of Republicans voting for it. It was sent to the Senate uh, and was not brought to the floor for a vote. So that's the state of play in the legislature. But again, the governor has executive powers that are, while limited, are not non-existent. And he wants, uh, he, he set up this forum so that he can consider uh, the best information he can get from folks across Kentucky and uh, consider what room there is for executive action to move this issue. But I think we all understand that while it's his, uh, uh, his choices are, are not uh, non-existent, they will be limited. And to set up a system like you have 
in Ohio or, or you have in Illinois or other states uh, will certainly take legislative action. So uh, anyone else from the center section here? Okay, let's go over here. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, good evening. My name is Ethan Osborne and um, I myself, I suffer. Let me ask you if you tell us what county you live in. Kent, I've grown up in Kenton County, uh, born and raised here most Thank of my you. life. Thank you. And I suffer from severe PTSD, among other mental health conditions, including alcoholism. And I actually left this state because of the strict laws against cannabis a decade ago, and I moved to California, where I <laughs> was a cannabis grower myself for almost 10 years, uh, and I grew organic um, cannabis, and it helps treat my PTSD. And also I've had friends that left the state also for the same reason, one who suffered from epilepsy, another from multiple sclerosis. And my friend with epilepsy, um, his medications didn't do the job that the cannabis did. The cannabis all but almost stopped his seizures. And I think it's outrageous that it's taken us this long to get to this conversation when the, the the plant, this is a, a, a non-toxic, mostly harmless plant that's been grown in the state since before it was a state. And 3 million people a, a year die from alcohol use. 7 million people a year die from tobacco use, according to the World Health Organization. It's very rare that I've ever heard of anyone dying from organic cannabis use. And, um, the, a lethal dose of cannabis is virtually impossible to consume for a human being. And I just wanna say that this, we are the fourth poorest state in the country and we have the highest rates of cancer in the entire country. And many of these people need access to cannabis. We've lost people, we've, we've, people have left this state because of the draconian laws in the past against this plant that is harmless and is, is scheduled one drug federally and it's treated the same federally as heroin and crack cocaine, which is outrageous. And um, I, of course, think that a, a medical cannabis legalization is extremely important, but, and we will narrow this discussion to this, but we should also uh, completely legalize cannabis across the board, recreationally, industrial, and uh, medicinal to, to help create, um, to stimulate the economy of the state. And um, I just think that, you know, we have uh, an entire uh, tourist industry based around alcohol, but, can't, but yet this, this plant is demonized. And I think that's hypocritical. And I think it's time for a change now. Thank you, sir, for your remarks. Anyone else from this section, ma'am? Hi, I'm Rhonda Wood from Muhlenberg County, but lucky enough to have a babysitting cottage in Kenton County. So I'm happy to be here and I appreciate the study that's going on. And I also appreciate the fact that our governor is on the right side of this issue. I taught school for more than 40 years. And after having all those kids in my class, these stories break my heart. To think of any child suffering needlessly is a heartbreaker. And I realize that the governor's powers are somewhat limited as far as legislation is concerned, but I do hope he'll take some corrective action as much as he can. And I would say to everyone here, if there are 38 states who have passed this and Kentucky has not, something is wrong. And as a retired teacher who knows that good public schools are built by a legislature in the state, I know that this can be changed. I appreciate Buddy Wheatley's work. I appreciate Rachel Roberts 
and I certainly appreciate Patty Mentor. And as a teacher, I follow that legislature. I know what goes on. I know those votes. And I also know that in November, each one of us will have a choice of who we send there. And if we don't look at our own ballots in our own precincts, then what's happening to kids and adults who need this medicine? It's on our shoulders. We have to be responsible. Kentucky has to change. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Hi, my name is Beth Kruer. Um, sorry, I'm from Boone County, Kentucky. I was born and raised here. My husband was born and raised here also, and he, um, he up until a few months ago, we were an active duty army family. Um, I ask for patience. <clears throat> this is my first time speaking out uh, since recent events on the island of Oahu. Um, I started advocating here in Kentucky a few years when my husband was stationed at Fort Knox after using cannabis in Las Vegas to treat PTSD, anxiety, and depression for a rape when I was 15. It worked so well that we made the decision to continue my use even though we moved out of a legal state into an illegal state. And then again, when we moved here to Kentucky, um, I was continuing to use it to help. It was the only thing that was keeping me alive at this point. I was ready to take my life in 2016 before I tried cannabis again. Uh, while we were here in Kentucky, I shared with my primary care physician that I was using it to fully disclose information. And she blew me off as a paranoid stoner when I then went to her uh, with symptoms of Rocky Mountain spotted fever. I went undiagnosed with Rocky Mountain spotted fever in this state for a year and a half. When it was finally diagnosed, it was after an ER visit when I thought I was having multiple strokes in one week and it took begging this doctor to test me for everything to finally get a diagnosis. Um, when I went to a rheumatologist, she sent me to, instead of an infectious disease specialist, he told me that had I not been using cannabis, my brain would have swollen within two weeks and I would have died. I started advocating after I met Julie and Kristen and Kentucky Moms for Medical Marijuana. Um, I met Governor Bashir when he was running for governor against Matt Bevin and shared my story then. Uh, we were, I could not leave the state. My husband was stationed at Fort Knox. So after that, he was transferred to Hawaii where I did get my medical cannabis card and was using very successfully until we moved homes to um, the Navy's water lines. And I don't know if anybody is aware of what's been happening in Oahu, because Kentucky had tornadoes right after uh, the news broke, but the Navy has been spilling jet fuel from the Red Hill bulk fuel storage tanks into the aquifer since the installation. Over 180,000 gallons have leaked into the water and contaminated the aquifer. 93,000 plus uh, service members and their families living on Navy water lines were drinking in this water and bathing their children in this water. The Department of Health raised the ELAs with every spill the Navy had to meet the Navy's needs. So even though the DOH was saying that the levels were safe, they had raised them to astronomically unsafe levels. Um, I'm currently involved in uh, a lawsuit against our government for lying to all of us, hiding the truth, not disclosing what was in our water. So I have now survived toxic exposure. I have been forced out of a legal state. We are 
we're floating back and forth between family members because we had to get our kids off of this island. The whole aquifer is contaminated and it's, 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 the, it's coming out with each article day by day. Um, the mental health implications that not just myself, but every military spouse involved in this, every military personnel involved in this has suffered, they're very severe. Uh, these spouses, we are, we are, we're not just centralized to one location. And I would like to make it clear that I had my medical cannabis license while living on property that the Navy was leasing. So the Navy owns this property and leases it to a management company and the state of Hawaii granted me my medical cannabis license and I was using cannabis there on federal property. Uh, a lot of spouses are. A lot of spouses are using cannabis on the base. So the fact that, that here in my home state where I am supposed to feel the safest and supposed to be able to come back to, to heal from what has happened to us. I have, I have jet fuel chemicals in my body that are off the charts. My children have these chemicals in their body off the charts. I have nowhere to go that is safe, that I can safely use my medication that I've been prescribed to use. And I feel every day that I'm putting my family at risk, that I'm here. It's not fair that Kentuckians who are suffering are having to leave the state to go and find medication. And then when we do find it, if things happen and we have to come back home, we do not have access to that medication that has been helping us. Military families, Hawaii is not the only, the only base that is affected. It's every, every single base in this country that has levels of contamination and military families are moved around. We, <laughs> We were lied to. I, I, <clears throat> I'm coming here sharing this story of what happened to us in Hawaii because I feel very, very strongly that home, home grows need to be an option. As it was coming out that our water was contaminated and that the DOH had raised the safe levels of toxins allowed in the water, I started to question the testing of the cannabis. And if it was not cannabis that was also making us sick and having our symptoms. I could read a whole entire list of symptoms for you all, but you've heard so many other stories. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I have to wrap it up. I am out of time. So I really just ask that when you make your considerations, you please keep in mind that there are a lot of military families that rely on this medication and we are moved around the country serving and protecting. And when Kentucky, when Kentucky drafts all of the um, oversight and testing, please keep in mind home grows are so important, so important. Because even though you could think that your product is safe, it could not be. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Huh. Sorry. <laughs> I made notes. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. I came today as a Kentuckian and a mother. Ma'am, I'm sorry, but would you give us your name? I'm sorry, you yeah. Thank you. thank you for, sorry, I meant to say thank you for having this panel because there's a stigma, I agree with that, attached to this. And, you know, I may not even like telling you what county I'm from because people may judge me for that, you know? So I'm going to say, put it out there. My name's Amanda Cackle. I live in Kenton County. I'm a mother of three and a wife. I came here today as a mother and a daughter and as a wife of a physician. I understand the importance of these town hall meetings. Some would say it's a way to delay medical marijuana, but I hope this is not the case. I have my concerns as a mother of two young impressionable children. I see other states' mistakes where our state can do it better. I believe vapes are dangerous and this will be what will hurt the children will be these vapes where they attach them, where it's changed, the chemicals are changed in this. I prefer it to be available in a more natural form. 
I don't want to shop on every corner like I hear other states have. Close to the colleges and they're told you can't sleep, get this prescription and you can use this. I don't think it should be just for somebody that needs to sleep or a college student that's not sleeping at night to sleep. So my daughter told me don't tell all this sappy stuff. But if I don't, who will? There is a video, you can see Key and Peele show the definition of this. It's a comedy skit, if none of you guys have ever seen it. The guy walks into the doctor and, you know, he's just, just needs to say he, he need, needs it for pain or he needs it and the guy doesn't understand it. They'll give it to you for anything. I don't want to become the state that gives it to you for anything. That said, as a daughter whose mother truly suffered of stage four cancer in 2020, now is the time. Enough waiting and enough suffering. As I stand here today, you probably cannot tell. I myself suffer from multiple sclerosis, which there is no cure. And I've had it for seven years. I've learned to walk again. My heart has stopped two times due to allergic reactions to medication given at a hospital. I was told initially I had lymphoma and it was an area of the brain and they couldn't operate. I've had itches for 19 days straight. <laughs> Today is the last day. <laughs> This is every day for many Kentuckians. We are enduring, we're waiting for our state. Please don't make another generation endure and suffer. Hi, thank you for having us here today, appreciate it. I actually uh, graduated from this university in 1997 with a journalism degree, and again in 2000 with my Master of Public Administration. Um, I went on to a career here in Northern Kentucky um, and uh, later moved to Las Vegas uh, with my then husband and uh, had two back surgeries after I had uh, discovered degenerative disc disease. Um, and uh, I had uh, a growing uh, addiction to opioid medicine. Um, my surgeon in, at the time in, in Nevada uh, was able to recommend medical marijuana, which had just become legal there in Nevada in 2015. And uh, I was able to use it to uh, curb my growing addiction, which had grown to about 20 Vicodin a day. It should have and could have killed me, um, but I was able to be saved in time for that medical marijuana to work for me. Um, I then came back to, and moved back to Ohio after my divorce and uh, had to go back to opioids for a year during 2018 while I was awaiting uh, the medical marijuana program here in, in, over in Ohio. Um, and uh, I uh, was able to enroll in that program at, at the beginning of 2019. And in July, 2019, I was able to leave pain management and I took my last opioid, opioid pill. Um, since that time, I have also uh, used my my uh, training here that I learned at Northern Kentucky University to develop Medicaid Ohio, which is a nonprofit medic medical uh, marijuana support magazine um, online, MedicaidOhio.com. We have told over 200 stories of successful cannabis patients in Ohio. Um, I also happen to be a property owner here in Boone County and would love to move as a permanent resident to Kentucky. Um, so I beg you to make this decision and to, uh, to help, help 
patients like me be able to legally use THC here. Uh, I've learned so much over the past several years about medical cannabis, um, and uh, I am grateful that Ohio gives me that opportunity, but I would like that opportunity in Kentucky. And I also, my partner here uh, also is a uh, Desert Storm veteran who uses cannabis to treat his PTSD and has done so successfully for many years. So we beg you to make this decision. Um, I understand that it's a controversial one. I write about it all the time uh, in Medicaid Ohio. Um, there are uh, a lot of studies out there that support cannabis. There are also a lot of studies out there that are uh, of dubious uh, origin that uh, are not supporting cannabis. Um, in, in, in the, the current, in, in the most modern and current sense. Um, and they're looking at studies that are older. And so I beg uh, the people in the, the medical community to make sure you're looking at the most recent science. Um, it's coming out all the time. So you can't really rely on what you did now. So I beg you to um, keep these things in mind when you uh, make your decisions. And I appreciate you giving me time to speak today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, hey, we're uh, close to the time. Do we have others? Yes. But just to ask you if you would, please keep it brief. Hi there. My name is Darlene Holcomb Sawinski. I am from Boone County, Kentucky. I grew up here, um, except for 1988. Um, I married and went to Virginia. Um, my ex husband now is was in the Navy Special Forces for 10 years. So I was a military wife. Special Forces for 10 year in Virginia Beach. I just wanna thank everybody that has a uh, military. Thank you. Um, I have been in holistic healthcare for, since 1988, it started in Virginia Beach. So 34 years. And I um, manage chiropractic offices. I'm a licensed massage therapist and holistic um, therapeutic massage and body worker certified for that. I do therapy for chiropractic offices. Um, I've worked for probably 10 of them in Northern Kentucky. I've worked for them in, um, also in North Carolina. My point is that they confide to me over these 34 years, the only way they can get relief with chronic pain, migraines, everything that people have said here, epilepsy, we had a patient with epilepsy is to use cannabis on the side in private, afraid that they're gonna get arrested, you know? Um, and they talk to me about this. They are anywhere from young people, elderly people, active duty military veterans. I have a lot of them that I'll do for massage therapy and they confide in me because they know that I was a Navy SEAL wife and a, um, an ombudsman where everybody would come and tell me things and then I'd have to go down the chain of command. Uh, I did that for 10 years. Um, they need cannabis, medical cannabis. They don't need opioids. I am divorced because they fed my husband opioids, cocaine, yes, cocaine. Um, I found a big bag in his duffel bag and I'm from domestic abuse. I was almost killed because of that. Um, they need to have something else. And when they protect us and serve us, we need to be there for them. And I wanna, and, and for everybody, um, my, one of my daughters broke her back when she was 16. They prescribed her Percocet six weeks, cut her off cold turkey. She went using on the street. They couldn't snort it anymore, apparently. So they started injecting it. Then they, um, that didn't work. So she went to heroin. I didn't know this. I'm a single mom working. I didn't know. Long story short, she overdosed. Um, flat line for 10 minutes by the grace of God and two Narcans she came back 
I had custody of my two twin grandsons at 52, a single mom working full time, two 18 month old twins. She tried Tenbrook recovery works. And then I finally told Judge Shran, you put her in jail, you send her as far away as you can to a six month treatment program. That's what will work because it has to be a brain program, a brain change with the opioid addiction. It worked by the grace of God. She has her kids back now, two years. She has a job. Although she is a felon and she can't vote or do anything, she wants to move so she can have access to medical cannabis because she has excruciating back pain. What is she gonna do? So she wanted me to come here to tell her story and my story. And it has affected a lot of people. And also with all these patients that I talk, I'm, I work for a chiropractor now. Um, and I just had somebody the other day say, I can only get rid of this pain if I smoke a good joint. These pills don't work for me. I can't, and I'm like, I'm going to a medical cannabis meeting later on this week. It's out there and we need your help. And I appreciate you all coming here and remembering us at the very tip top of the state. And I wish I could be on your all's advisory committee. Um, I would like to say one more thing that with, it needs to be regulated. I would like for it to be, okay, like we have all these methadone and Subutex and whatever clinics that are out here. My daughter goes there every day and takes methadone. Every single day, it's a ball and chain. Can't go on vacation, gotta get my methadone. It's very toxic. There's been children that have died because they drank out of a cup that their mom had from that. So medical cannabis is a lot less toxic than methadone, subutex, suboxone. And I would like it to be controlled. And I would like for Medicaid to pay for it, just like it pays for the methadone, $15 a day. And I've been in medical insurance billing for 35 years. And I left them my email address. If you all have any questions about anything, I would be more than happy to talk to you all. And I appreciate everyone here that's come out to take a stand for it. Thank you. Thank you for one more. Hello. Oh, I don't wanna take it. My name is Noelle Higdon Grimes. I'm from Boone County. I've also lived in Louisville and Columbus, Ohio. Um, I'm here today for two reasons. The first, um, to tell my husband's story. He was unable to come tonight. In 2004, at age 37, he was diagnosed with colon cancer. And um, for several reasons, he ended up going to New York, Sloan Kettering, to have his surgery. And the night before his surgery, he's in a room with 25, 30 other gentlemen, of which he was the youngest. Everyone else was age 60 and above. And they weren't discussing the meds that the doctors were going to be prescribing them after their surgery, as far as the Percocet, the Oxycodone, or anything. They were all discussing where they were going to get their marijuana after the surgery to help offset the side effects from the surgery, the chemotherapy and the medication that they were gonna be on. Um, he thought that was quite interesting, wondering how every single one of them were discussing that option. Of course, he was coming back to Kentucky two weeks after his surgery, so he didn't get any advice on where to get that. Um, he did find out why they were talking about that once he returned because of all the side effects from the chemotherapy and the medication. When his eyeballs started bulging out of his eyes or feeling like they were going to erupt. And that's when he was able to find some, of course it was illegal at the time, 2004, to get something to help alleviate that pain. Um, if he had had 
he also just told me this, <laughs> um, that he actually did get um, some marijuana to use for that aspect. But it's something that in Kentucky, if it was known at that time, if 100% of the people, well, 99% since my husband didn't know it, at the time knew that the marijuana was gonna be, medical cannabis was gonna be able to help them through the chemotherapy and everything in 2004, we're in 2022 now. Lots, lots happened since then. Second reason I'm here is I finally decided that it's time to step up and um, come to these type of meetings to discuss things that we really need to do in Kentucky. We're too far behind. One of the advantages though of being behind now, if we are one of the last few states to come to this, we can learn from everyone else's mistakes and we should be able to come on board with legalizing medical <coughs> cannabis in a quicker method. Um, it's time for Kentucky to step up and allow patients and their doctors to prescribe what they need. That's all I have. Before we go, and we are just a little over time, I want to ask if anyone on our committee would like to say anything. I'd ask you to keep it brief, but I uh, want to hear from you. Uh, okay, let's, let's just be respectful of, of the audience's time and just keep your remarks brief, please. Thank you all for your stories. Thanks for sharing. I know uh, from experience, it's not easy, but thank you all for doing it. That's what it's gonna to take to get this legal. We have to talk about it to everybody. There's not that big of a stigma. We got a few people in the legislators holding us up. It'd be legal, but just a few people in the legislation. But we gotta keep telling our stories. And thank you all. Um, I just want to say, um, someone asked a question, how do we deal with the opposition? I think you might have asked that. And I want to tell you that we do a lot of crying and we do a lot of um, using our voice 24-7. I mean, we, the advocates I know, we pretty much live this. It's every day, all day. Um, and I also want to say that, um, you know, I know that we need studies and that kind of thing, but the real um, thing we need to do is listen to the experts, which are the patients. And I appreciate you all coming out and giving your stories. Thank you. I too just wanna thank everybody for being here. Um, for the mom, the first one that spoke with the daughter with epilepsy and the other little special needs girl <clears throat> that came up in a wheelchair. I have one like both of you all. She's in the hotel room a couple miles away right now. Um, I sympathize with you all so much, and that's why I do this. Um, I just want to let you know that I am fighting for you every single day, and I won't stop until this is done. Um, thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, I was fighting back tears, I think, during almost everyone that spoke. Um, I did want to, um, I truly believe that regulation is needed. I believe we, everybody that wants to take ma medical marijuana, marijuana in general, have safe access to it. I do believe that regula regulations are important. I believe testing is important. There are some hemp companies that do test. I'm just going to leave that there because I'm one of them. Um, and my husband is an audit certified CGMP, and he has been with the hemp program since 2014. We got in this business because he is a veteran and he has seizures, and it changed his life. They had him on 28 pills a day, and those pills were killing him. So when I hear your stories, know that that's why I'm here. I may not be a nurse, and I may not be a doctor, but I am an advocate, and I am an expert when it comes to hemp products in general and how they can help. And the one lady was right. You do have to be careful when you take these medications. Dr. Amber, Can, and I have talked about that many times. So if you are on other medications, 
make sure that you know to talk to a doctor before you just start using them. Yeah, <laughs> or a pharmacist. <laughs> but thank you again for being here. We really do appreciate your stories and you guys sharing them with us. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, as a pharmacist, I think it's so important that we as patients share with our healthcare professionals that we do use cannabis. I, I tell my fellow pharmacists, you do have patients who use cannabis, whether you know it or not. And I encourage pharmacists to ask patients, do you use cannabis? We need to remove that stigma. Um, whether, whether we're in a, in a legal state or not, I do believe that as, uh, we, health, as the healthcare community needs to step up and start asking patients because there are serious drug interactions. There are serious medical complications that can come from mixing prescription drugs to traditional type of drugs and cannabis and even CBD. Unfortunately, there are a lot of complicated things about divulging it, yes. And so, I, I, but from a medical, I agree, it's not, there's no um, easy answer to that. Um, one thing I wanted to address is I also agree that quality control, um, uniform dosage forms, not just the cookies and the things like that is very important to me as a pharmacist. And Rose was the nurse practitioner. Um, she mentioned that you know, nurse practitioners should have representation. In House Bill 136 that was passed by the House in the last session, the, there was a committee set up and nurse practitioners did play a role as a, as a key a key part of that. So even though there isn't a nurse practitioner on this council um, uh, in the future, hopefully if that legislation is the jumping off point in the next session, then um, nurse practitioners would be a part of decision making, I hope. I just wanted to, my name is Nick Coons. I'm a palliative care physician, uh, originally from Northeastern Kentucky and Greenup County, the country like a lot of you people are from. And I just wanted to say, you all honor us by telling us the stories that you tell, because it takes an incredible amount of courage to share some of the things that you've shared with us. Um, unlike some of my colleagues, I did not try to hold it back. I sat up here and cried like a baby, but it is absolutely tragic to have to feel like a criminal to treat someone that you love and care for. I will say that your courage is inspiring, I hope that there are the politicians, I will say this, there are certain politicians who have obstructed the legislation getting onto the Senate, and it is brutalizing to the citizens of Kentucky. I work as a palliative care physician, and what is so tragic is that every story here told more often than not by a loving, a loved one, a mother, a, a wife, a husband, who spoke up. And it's so tragic because I have heard this so many times Tending to people in Powell County or Clark County or Greenup County, where I started to pay a little care, you know, when my mother died. So my heart goes out for you. My frustration goes out for you. My prayers go up for you. And I promise you, I promise you that we hear everything that you're saying. I am tired of people that my own loved ones having felt like criminals, people who are marginalized, who have been hurt by previous cannabis laws and regulations or the, the lack thereof. I am absolutely devastated as a fellow Kentucky citizen to hear your stories. And I promise you that we up here every single day will do everything that we can to make sure that your voices are heard because they are mighty. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for being here. Um, I had the pleasure of working in a medical marijuana clinic in Georgia. I was the owner and the only practitioner I can say that it was a tremendous learning experience. And speaking to, to Rose, the nurse practitioner, uh, education is extremely important. Physicians in general don't know enough about medical marijuana, much less how to treat patients. Patients don't understand <clears throat> using medical marijuana, but please know that clinics are set up with strict guidelines. We had certain conditions that we could treat and um, patients had to bring documentation that they actually had those conditions. So it is, you know, it's just not given to anybody that comes in. So um, I support you. Thank you for being here. And um, hopefully I'll be a part of the education. Thanks so much for sharing these powerful, powerful stories. 
Um, and I think, you know, as has been said, it, unless until the legislature acts, there's only so much the governor can do, but I think it's so, uh, so great and I'm thankful to the governor for trying to do everything that he can until that happens. And I'm optimistic that at the end of this process, the governor is going to take whatever action he is able to do uh, under the law um, to move this issue forward. Uh, thanks. I am DJ Wasset. I work at the Public Protection Cabinet here representing uh, my cabinet secretary, Ray Perry. And just like I think so many others um, have said, I really just want to thank you. These are powerful stories. As it was said, your voices are mighty. I've taken copious notes. I promise you we will. Um, we've all heard, but we will compile those and, and get those to the governor and, and share your stories and do what we can to move this issue forward. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you all for your time and your stories tonight. I think we're probably done, but we'll be sticking around for a while if anybody wants to talk to us more. So thank you. Okay, we all can be polite and we need to be polite to each other. But this is what I have to say. I've been studying cannabis for about 30 years, talking to cannabis researchers all across the United States, all across the globe. I can call them anytime. There are drug interactions. Yes, they are. There are side effects from marijuana just by itself. But we're overselling the drug side effects. Besides Coumadin and an epileptic drug, which marijuana blocks from working, can build up toxic in your system. The rest of the drugs, if you weigh over 100 pounds, are not going to be traumatically dangerous to you. And that's what I'll, and it won't never kill you. Might feel out of whack, but it's not going to kill you. to the website if you wish to make further comments. All of that will be considered. This has been a great meeting, very strong attendance, and we appreciate what everybody's had to say. Particularly appreciate Northern Kentucky University for your hospitality. I understand you may have something for us out here, so that's good. And yes, sir, um, please be brief. It's yeah, time for us to go home. Really quick, if there's just one thing I wanted to add, uh, a message to lawmakers that they should put the working class people and the agrarian peasantry above corporations and their monopolies and rich businessmen who are trying to make money off this. This should be for the benefit of the people. Thank you. That's an important message to end on will be adjourned. Thank you.